to highlight a few announcements before we get to that. I just want to call your attention to something really special. Serving today in this worship service, there are three generations of the Stover family. Keep an eye out for that. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'm sorry, next week, next Sunday, next Sunday is the beginning of Daylight Savings Time. So if you don't set your clocks back, you'll be in church an hour early, which would be fine. It'd give you extra time to pray. But for those of you who don't want that, just remember to turn your clocks forward an hour. Today, going on right now and until they run out of food, Love Inc. is serving chicken and biscuits. And it should be a very, hopefully good, but certainly interesting meal. You might want to check it out. It's chicken biscuits with just a hint of barbecue, probably. It should be special. So, Lenten services, please remember, they're every Wednesday at noon. We have a brief half an hour or so worship service. And then you can leave after the worship service at 1230 if you have to get back to work or something else. Or you can stick around for a delicious meal catered by Joe, Joe Gianti. Finally, we will be working, our congregation will be working with Kids Night Out at the YMCA on March 22nd. And that announcement used to say, if you'd like to help out, please come by and sign up. I am delighted to say that we now have more than enough people to help sponsor that event. Are there other announcements I would like to make? Let us worship God. Morning. morning. As we come together to worship God, let us join together in the gathering prayer. Ever present God, your word says that you are always with us, but sometimes we do not feel it. Your word says that you rule right now, but sometimes we do not see it. Give us faith to trust you. Give us grace to perceive your loving presence and to see some of the ways you are working in the world. Equip, empower, and guide each of us to receive and to share your truth and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen.
Today's call to assurance, or call to confession and assurance of pardon, should be very familiar. They come from John 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Trusting in the saving work of Jesus, let us confess our sins together. Almighty triune God, you alone know how often we sin by wandering from your ways, by wasting your gifts, by contributing to the destruction of your creation, by failing to love as you love and in other ways of which we are not aware. Please forgive us. Help each of us to perceive the truth about ourselves, the truth that despite our best efforts, we are still sinners who urgently need your forgiveness and transforming grace. Show us the positive changes you want to make in us. Give to each of us a sincere repentance, which includes a renewing of our minds, a reordering of our priorities, and a conforming of our characters and behaviors to those of Jesus. Tenderly draw us closer to yourself. Give us the desire and the power to open ourselves to your transforming work, to grow as disciples, and to live each day as your grace-saved, gratitude-filled, spirit-led, cherished children. In the great and mighty name of Jesus we pray, amen. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. turning around and doing a quick survey and I see that my two regular girls who usually are up here for children's time are not here but I will continue you know the uh, scripture that we'll, we'll share is um, very interesting because Jesus goes to the temple. It's the one time I really think uh, Jesus got a little ticked where I could use some other colorful words, but I won't. Jesus got mad because they had cattle, sheep, and ducks, doves, etc., for sacrifice. But what they were doing was they up the price because that's where they had, the people had to buy them. Now, 
You bought your animals at the temple at a higher price. You were at the mercy of the people who sold them. And Jesus did not like it, what he saw. It made him mad. So he turned over a few tables. Um, we, I don't think we like to think about Jesus getting ticked off, but he did. And rightfully and righteously so. He did not approve of the money changers. They needed to change their ways. They really, really did. Get these things out of here. You know, he was pretty forward about that. Well, what about us? Does God need to do some spring cleaning with us? Does he need to, in this Lenten season, challenge us to give our hearts over, cleanse our hearts, clean our minds? You know, I know I'm talking to the choir, so to speak. Faithful people that come to church. But even us faithful people do some wrong. And so think about it. I sit or I am, is it good for others or just ourselves? When we talk to people and we share with people, is it good for others or are we just looking out for ourselves? I think it's better that we look out for others. Serve Jesus with our whole heart and with all our love. And I think that that will be a great focus. Amen and amen.
Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, by the Holy Spirit, cause us to hear what we need to hear and show us what we need to do in order to more fully enter and enjoy the new life that you make possible right now through Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today's scripture reading prescribed for us by the Revised Common Lectionary is John 2, verses 13 through 22. Hear the word of the Lord. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves and other people sitting at tables, exchanging money. So Jesus made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jewish leaders then responded to him, what sign will you show us to prove your authority to do these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple Jesus had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. God's word for us, God's children. In today's passage, Jesus presents himself as the new and true temple of the living God. In a few minutes, we will discuss that wonderful fact and how Jesus as the new and true temple of the living God applies to our daily living. But before we get to that, I feel the need to address the question of whether Jesus cleansed the temple once or twice. Now, please understand, if that's not a burning question in your lives, good for you. It's it's, It's wonderful to not have that question. But there are some people who read John 2 and they see the temple cleansing there and then they read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they see the temple cleansing there, and they don't see those two passages as connecting with one another. And I'm here to tell you, they don't. Careful analysis shows that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are narrating the same event, and that event took place just days before Jesus went to the cross to accomplish the salvation of all people who would ever trust in him. Matthew, Mark, and Luke report a cleansing of the temple just days before the cross. But John chapter two presents a completely different event. And if we look at them carefully, we see a number of differences. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the complaint of Jesus is that people were doing dishonest business in the temple. Price gouging. We all remember what that's like. Well, that was the problem in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But in John, the problem is different. In John, the problem that Jesus points to is that people are doing business in God's temple at all. The problem is that the money changers and the animal sellers were getting in the way of the worship 
of other people. And that calls us to prayerful reflect on whether or not there's anything that we do that gets in the way of the worship of other people. When you think about the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, it was actually a series of squares and rectangles, but I find it helpful to conceptually think of it like an archery target. We all know what an archery target looks like. You've got the yellow small ring in the center. That's the bullseye. That's the holy of holies where God's presence was localized on earth. The next concentric ring was the court of the priests. You guessed it, only priests could enter it. And then there was the court of Jewish men. Only Jewish men could enter it. And then the court of women. But it wasn't all women, it was just Jewish women. And then finally, in the fifth concentric circle out, there was the court of the Gentiles. And that was where all non-Jews were allowed to go to pray and to worship the one true God, the God of Israel. And it was there in that outer court, the court of the Gentiles, that the money changers had set up business and the animals were being sold. And here in John 2, the problem isn't that they're being priced high. The problem is that they're there at all because the baying of sheep and the mooing of cattle and all the other animal sounds and smells were getting in the way of people's attempt to worship. Two different problems, two different times, about three years apart. In fact, we know with more certainty than any other event in the New Testament, we know, not certainty, let's say precision. We can date the temple cleansing in John 2 with more precision than any other event in the New Testament. Now that bothers some people when we think of the fact that, you know, when was Jesus born? Well, I think Jesus was born about 6 B.C., now that does not line up very well because we think of Jesus as being born in zero. But they didn't have a year zero back then. The whole calendar has changed. And all dates from you know, the BC period and the early AD, AD period are approximate dates. Plus or minus two years, if we're lucky. Plus or minus five years. Sometimes plus or minus 10 years. But we know that the temple cleansing recorded in John chapter 2 occurred in the month of March or the month of April in the year 27 or the year 28 AD. That's pretty precise when you're going back 2,000 years. How do we know that? I'm glad you asked. We know that it was March or April, because Jesus had journeyed to Jerusalem for the Passover, which is always in what we call March or April. And we know that it was 27 or 28 AD because of the words spoken in verse 20. Let me read them to you again. Now remember, Jesus had just said, speaking about his body, not about the temple, he had just said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. He was talking about his death and resurrection. But, as is often the case, the people who rejected him did not understand him. And I'll tell you what, people who reject Jesus today don't understand him. Because if we really understand him, we accept him as our Lord and Savior. But the people who did not trust him and could not understand what he was talking about, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. And the doubters said, Verse 20, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days. 
And that reference to 46 years applies to the temple expansion project initiated by Herod the Great in 20 BC or 19 BC. So if we add 46 years to 20 or 19 BC, we get AD 27 or 28. Now, please bear with me. These details and dates lead us to a very important point. At the time of John chapter two, teams of laborers had been breaking their backs working on this temple expansion project for 46 years. That's longer than the average person works in their career. 46 years Herod's temple expansion and beautification project have been going on. Now we know from Josephus, the famous historian, that the temple expansion project was completed in AD 63 or 64. Now that means, and we're so close to the point you can taste it, that means that the temple expansion took between 82 and 84 years to complete. When it was done, it was one of the most glorious, impressive structures ever built by the hands of humans. In fact, after a three-year siege, when General Titus and the Roman army finally broke through the walls of Jerusalem, Titus saw the beauty of the temple, and General Titus did his best to prevent his troops from looting and destroying the Jerusalem temple. But Jesus had decreed the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, and not Titus nor anybody else could stop what the Lord had prophesied. Glorious as it was, that temple, which took between 82 and 84 years to perfect, glorious as it was, it stood for only six or seven years. Imagine that. Imagine a building more glorious than anything you've ever seen that costs more than any building that ever has existed or that exists in our country anyway. A building covered with so much gold that you could barely look at it in the bright sun. Imagine spending 84 years building and beautifying that place and then it being destroyed in six or seven years. We know it was destroyed six or seven years later because it's just uncontested historical fact that AD 70, and yes, that's a real date. We know that it was the year 70 AD. The Romans destroyed that temple in Jerusalem. And that's amazing. And it really deserves our prayerful reflection. 80 plus years to build and it only lasted for six or seven years. My friends, it's possible for us to work very hard, to spend lots of money, and to build something that looks impressive, only to have it disappear. It's even possible to claim and to believe that our working, our spending, and our building is for the glory of God, but yet to be self-deceived like King Herod was. Sometimes people think that they're doing something for the glory of God when actually their actions are motivated by sinful pride. The destruction of Herod's glorious temple dramatically illustrates the truth of Psalm 127, which says, unless 
you know what? Say it with me. Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. And remember what Jesus says. He says it in, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 and at the end of the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6. He says that if we are not building our lives on his word, then our lives are like a house built on sand, a house that cannot survive the storm. So what about you? Are you investing yourself in something that will disappear? On what are you building your life? Are you building your life on the shifting sand of human wisdom, which God calls foolishness, by the way? Are you building your life on the shifting sand of human opinion, human wisdom, or are you building your life on the one true foundation, the solid rock of Jesus and his teaching? Please prayerfully ponder those questions this Lent. Now let's return to the fact that Jesus is here in John 2 presenting himself as the new true temple of the living God. The Jewish temple in Jerusalem used to be the place where people offered sacrifices to God. But Jesus replaced that Jerusalem temple even before it was destroyed. Jesus replaced the Jerusalem temple because the cross of Christ became the place where God offered the perfect sacrifice, the sacrifice that ended the efficacy of all other sacrifices, the one perfect sacrifice that can pay the sin debt for every sin of every person who trusts in Jesus as Savior and Lord. In addition, to being the place where people had previously offered sacrifices. The Jewish temple used to be the primary place where God was present on earth. You know, Solomon, when he was, after he had built the temple in his prayer, he says, you know, that the whole earth cannot contain God, let alone the temple that Solomon had built which is true, but God chose to just make that Jerusalem temple, the Holy of Holies, like his address on earth. But when Jesus came, Jesus himself became the primary place where God was located on earth. The presence of God was moved from the Holy of Holies to Jerusalem to Jesus himself as the primary presence of the living God. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, he designated something else to be the primary place where God is present. Do you know what that new temple is today? I think I heard it. Do you know where God lives, where God's primary presence is today? Did you look in the mirror today? Have you looked around this place? We find the answer to that question in many passages, but for the sake of brevity, I'll give you only one. 1 Corinthians 3.16. It says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Do you not know that you our God's temple, and that God's spirit lives in you. Paul goes on to 
warn us to take good care of God's temple, which is us, but not just us, all our brothers and sisters in Christ. But we, those, the people who follow Jesus in all times and places, we are now the primary place and the primary way that God is present in the world today. That's not my opinion. That's the word of the Lord in multiple places. So if we are not out there carrying the presence of God into the world, if we are not out there shining the light of Jesus, in the darkness, then we truly are like a lamp that's hidden under a box. God intends you and me to be vessels of God's own presence in the world. That's a heavy responsibility. And we could never live up to God's call for us to be the presence of God out in the world if God were not living inside us and guiding us and empowering us to do that very thing. We are called to be vessels of the presence of God. We are called to be the body of Christ in and for the world. That has many applications to our lives, but I'll give you just one. Because we are God's representatives, because we are, scriptural phrase, the body of Christ, because God has chosen to dwell in Christians by God's Holy Spirit and to, be, to make us the primary presence of God in the world today. That means that the way that you and I live is either drawing people to Jesus or pushing people away from Jesus. The way we live, the way we speak and act out in the world is either drawing people to Jesus or pushing them away. For that reason, we are wise to ask Jesus daily to help us to live in such a way that we do shine his light and we do share his love and we do lift him up so that he can draw people to himself. Jesus cleansed the Jerusalem temple twice. And he's cleansed this temple more than twice, a whole lot more. And he's cleansed you, temple, many, many times. And we need frequent cleansing. In fact, we need constant cleansing from Jesus. For our own good, for the sake of our witness, for the sake of the people who dwell in darkness, for the people who, as Paul says, are dead in trespasses and sin. And for the glory of God, please, let's go to Jesus sincerely and frequently. And let's ask him to show us the things that he wants to help us remove from our lives. And let's ask him to show us the things that, we, that he wants to help us add to our lives so that we can bring the presence, the truth, and the love of Jesus to the people who need him. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This month, Ellen and I had our monthly discussion about whether or not we were going to do communion with the individual servings prepared in a totally sterile environment, or if we were going to go back to passing the elements like we used to. And we were leaning toward going back to doing the way we used to. But then COVID hit very close to home. And this month, we're doing it this style. God willing, we will soon be passing juice and bread like brothers and sisters in Christ are supposed to. Until then, Tom, you know your job. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Gracious God, it is truly right in our joy to give you thanks and praise. In your wisdom, you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image to love and serve you. You gave us your law to guide us in, our, in your way. You spoke through the prophets, calling us to turn from our self-willed ways to new obedience and righteousness. You sent your only Son to be the way to eternal life. Therefore, we praise you. Join our voices with choirs of angels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Holy God, because of your love, you sent Jesus to accomplish the salvation of all who trust in him. He shared our life in every way, and though tempted, was sinless to the end. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. He went willingly to his death and by your power was raised to new life. In his dying and rising, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and you made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. Remembering your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and we joyfully celebrate the redemption won for us in Christ Jesus. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Gracious God, pour out the Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ and through them do in us whatever you desire to do. Work in us so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By the Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. With your Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, our Savior took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, my blood which is poured out for many, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. 
If you trust in Jesus as your Lord, or if you even are willing to trust in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, he invites you to come to his table, regardless of any church membership you may have or may not have. If you want more of Jesus, come. He is here for the taking. good news of Jesus Christ, primarily in the New Testament. But the foundation of the New Testament is the Old Testament. 
and to understand why Jesus died in our place, to understand why his blood was shed, and to understand what this sacred meal really means. We need the Old Testament, particularly we need Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, where God says to Moses and to us, he says, you shall not drink the blood of any creature, for the life is in the blood, and I have given you the blood to make atonement for your life. The life of every creature is in the blood. And what that means is that when we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are welcoming and by faith and by the Holy Spirit receiving the life of Jesus in us. Thank you, Jesus. Please join me in the prayer after communion. Loving God, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ and made us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we may proclaim your truth, share your redeeming love, and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we share our tithes and offerings, let us present ourselves to God as those who have been delivered from death to life. join together in the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen.
now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace today and forever. Amen.